While way, way up north on this dark, foggy night, awaiting the time for his Christmas Eve flight, good old Santa. Mmm, this fog will be hard to get through. tonight to lead all my deer on the rest of our flight. Dear Mommy and Daddy, I am going to help Santa. Don't worry. Rudolph, that's me. Hi, Rudolph. It's very dark here. With Rudolph's red nose as a wonderful light, old Santa flew quickly the rest of the night. Before it was day, the very last present was given away. Yeah, ye, yeah, ye, a message from Rudolph. Yes, they'd found Rudolph's message. It's all over town. Yeah, ye, yeah, ye, Rudolph at the stadium. Come on, come on. to do nothing but tease him? Well, now they'd do anything only to please him. Rudolph, my boy, they'll envy you now far and near, for no greater honor can come to a deer than riding with Santa and guiding my sleigh. 
the number one job on the number one day. I hope you'll continue to keep us from grief. I hereby appoint you Commander-in-Chief. And Rudolph just blushed from his head to his toes until his whole fur was as red as his nose. Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Then how the reindeer loved him as they shouted out with glee. Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer, you'll go down in history.
have just been listening to... Well, it's about time you youngsters went to bed. About time we all went to bed, so the Santa Claus will have a chance. Gee, I hope he will. Peter, what did you say? I'm sorry, Mother. I meant to say I hope he doesn't pass us by. I don't think he will. Will he bring a tree? We'll see. Now run along and we'll see about the tree later. Night, Peter. Good night, Connie. Good night, Daddy. Don't be in so much of a hurry. We've a lot of work ahead. Just let me get the tree in. Why not wait until they're asleep? You might make a noise. I won't make a sound. Please. Not yet, and he won't come until we're all fast asleep. So good night. Mommy, please bring me to sleep. All right, dear. <laughs> but what are you youngsters doing up? Why aren't you fast asleep? We heard you fall down. Well, I'm all right now. Suppose you go right back to bed. Have you got some toys for us? Well, maybe I have. May we have them now? Oh, no. Not till you wake up in the morning. Can't you where do all the toys come from? Will you promise to go right to sleep if I tell you? Oh, yeah. Well... Way up in the land of toys is a toy shop. Every night when the old toy maker has finished his day's work, he closes the door, locks up, and goes home for a well-earned rest. He's hardly out of sight when the toys come to life. <laughs>
mama bear, the mama bear and little junior too. They are here to to me in the north land canoe. Now okey hoey see, he's got his fender string. Zoom 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 dee dee dee, oh what fun to be in the tar review we bring to you. Toy boat old land canoe, little boy blue at a corn. Long ago, when life was simple, and men were tillers of the soil, and herders of flocks, there were in the ancient country of Palestine many shepherds. And among the shepherds, in the region called Judea, there was a man named Enoch, and his son named Seth. The sheep that Enoch and his son owned were many in number. And when they grazed, they were like snow on the Judean hills. Now it happened one day that some travelers came along the road and approached Enoch's tent. Enoch saw that they were Samaritans. And one of them said, Long way, and we still have a long way to go to our home in Samaria. We have with us a young lad who is ill. His mother died on the way, and he is an orphan. 
We fear he will not live unless he has rest and care. You are a man of substance. We pray you take the boy and keep him, for we cannot. But Enoch answered, What have I to do with Samaritans? For you are not of my people, and neither is the boy. I am old and have no wish to burden myself with him. Then Seth replied, Father, we have more than enough. It may be that the boy's illness is mostly hunger. I will care for him and he will be useful about the camp. We have need of a manservant, not a boy. He cannot do a shepherd's work. I will teach him to be a shepherd. Let his care be in my hands. Now as they were talking, the donkey with the orphan boy moved close to Seth. When Enoch saw this, he spoke, Surely this is a sign from heaven. Let the boy be given to Seth. And Seth cared for the boy and nursed him. And the boy grew strong and well. Seth took him into the hills and taught him to care for the sheep. Now the boy had no name, so Seth called him the Little Shepherd. Seth showed him where the best grass could be found and how to keep the sheep out of the brambles, where their wool might get caught in the thorns. But when the little shepherd tried, Seth showed him where water could be found for the flocks, and he showed him how to select a smooth stone from the brook how to whirl the sling and let the stone fly. <coughs> but when the little shepherd tried to sling a stone, he let it fly too soon, so that it curved to the right. Or he let it fly too late, so that it curved to the left. How could he protect his sheep if he couldn't use a sling? But Seth was very patient. There were times when an eagle would swoop low, looking for a lamb to seize. Then Seth would sling a stone, and frighten the eagle away. So the days passed. The little shepherd took his turn watching the flocks as the hot sun rose over the Judean hills. And when night came and the hills lay under the starlit sky, the shepherds gathered for the evening meal. And after supper, Enoch would tell marvelous stories of his people, stories handed down from father to son generation after generation, stories of the shepherd hero David, of the great wise King Solomon, and of the other great leaders of the tribes that settled long ago in Palestine. And later, Seth and the little shepherd would sit and talk, watching the stars. Seth showed the little shepherd how some stars formed patterns of men and beasts and he told him the names of many stars. And below the stars, the little shepherd could see a far off town, and he learned that the name of the town was Bethlehem. One day, Seth brought in a lamb whose mother had died. What would become of it? Enoch did not think it would live. But suppose someone, someone could give it care 
and love. So the lamb was given to the little shepherd. He took a small jar, fastened a bit of cloth to the spout, and taught the lamb to drink milk from it. So the lamb lived and became fond of the little shepherd and followed him. And the little shepherd loved his pet lamb and talked to him. And it was with him every day. Now the days were lonely on the hills, and sometimes the little shepherd saw no other person from dawn till sunset. But one day some shepherds came by. They laughed. <laughs> Is that the little shepherd we've heard about? But he plays with a lamb. He's not big enough to do a shepherd's work. It was true. He was small. But he wanted so much to be a good shepherd. That very night, as he was watching, what was that? The sheep were moving. Was there a wolf after them? He must get help. Carrying his lamb, he ran to the tent. Wolf, he cried. Wolf! At the sound of that dreaded word, Enoch and Seth awoke and rushed out. Enoch was too old to run, but he shouted, Go quickly! But when they came to the little ravine, the sheep were resting quietly beneath the rocky cliff. A rock must have fallen from the cliff, said Seth. There is no wolf. The little shepherd felt quite useless. For days after that, the little shepherd practiced with his sling. <coughs> Seth would be proud of him. So he watched. And then, one night, another noise. He could see nothing. Again, the sheep were moving. Was the wolf among them? Once again, he ran for help. Wolf, he cried. Wolf! And again, Enoch and Seth awoke. And once more, they listened to the boy as he told about the strange noise he had heard. But Enoch did not believe him. But remember, said Seth to his father, the boy has never seen a wolf, and he's only trying to be helpful. Enoch was not convinced, but Seth decided he would go. This time, the little shepherd led the way. But when they arrived, there was no wolf, only in the distance a faint sound from the road. There, said Seth. That is what you heard. It is only a man and a woman with their donkey on the road to Bethlehem. Seth was disappointed. No one will believe me anymore, thought the little shepherd, and he felt that his lamb was the only friend he had. One evening, as the little shepherd was watching as usual, he noticed a bright star. Even as he watched, it seemed to move. Higher and higher it rose. Surely this was not a star that Seth had shown him in the heavens. The little shepherd was filled with wonder. And as he watched, the star seemed to come to rest over the town of Bethlehem. Suddenly some shepherds came running. When the little shepherd asked where they were going, they replied, 
We are going into Bethlehem. An angel of the Lord appeared to us and brought us tidings of great joy. For unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. We're going now to see the babe lying in the manger. And the shepherds called, Come with us and see this thing which has happened. But the little shepherd turned and ran to Enoch's tent. The star, he called. The star. Seth arose. But Enoch hesitated, saying, It's the boy again, crying another false alarm. Words tumbled out as the little shepherd told about the star and the angel and how he wanted to go with the shepherds. You hear? said Enoch. He prattles of a star, and of an angel, and voices from heaven. <laughs> this is more ridiculous than his cries of wolf. But Seth answered, Father, perhaps he was too sleepy to watch the sheep and was dreaming. I will go and see. And at once the little shepherd pointed to the star. And he repeated all that the shepherds had told him. And Seth's heart was strangely moved. Do you believe it? asked the little shepherd. I believe it, said Seth. Then Seth asked the little shepherd how he would find the babe, since he had never been to Bethlehem. I will follow the star, said the little shepherd. And Seth answered, I will stay with the sheep. You may go. I will have to take my lamb, for he has never been left alone. So the little shepherd carried his lamb and ran toward the star. He found the road, and as he came toward the city, there were many people. The little shepherd made his way through the crowded streets. Could he find the place where the baby was? And then suddenly, the star shone above a small building. It was an inn. Quietly, the little shepherd approached the stable of the inn. Was this the place he was seeking? Yes, there were the shepherds, silently watching a tiny baby in a manger. The only sound was the lowing of the cattle. and the cooing of the doves. The little shepherd moved forward so that he could see the little babe and his mother and father. And then, as he knelt, it seemed to him that there was a glow of light around the manger. The little shepherd was filled with a feeling of love, and he thought, if only I had a wonderful gift to lay before this baby. But I have nothing to offer. Just then, his lamb moved toward the manger. For an instant, he tried to stop it. It was all he owned in the world. And then he thought, Yes, I will let my lamb go. It will be my gift to the baby. Please take my lamb. And as he watched, yes, the baby's mother smiled. And his lamb, it seemed its fleece was whiter than snow. And he knew his gift would be loved. Then he hurried out into the night. Out into the city. out across the hills, 
for his heart was bursting and he had much to tell Seth. When Seth saw him, he said, You have seen the babe in the manger. And then Enoch came out. And he asked, Where is your lamb? And so he told Enoch about his trip to Bethlehem. About the babe in the manger. And about his gift of the lamb. And Enoch believed all that he had told him. Truly, this is a holy night. Beaver said she'd come, but she'd have to bring her twins, too. 
So back went Peter through Cozy Valley. At the lone cabin, he stopped for a moment. He wondered what the gleaming colored lights on the little tree were for. Meanwhile, Buttons was on his way to call Inky the Crow when... <gasps> it was Rusty the Fox. <gasps> if only Buttons could reach the tree. There was Inky the Crow. Rusty jumped and missed. Buttons saw his chance and up he went, safe and sound. Later at the old oak, Doc Owl and the Bluebird and all the others were gathered. Doc Owl was in charge, since he was supposed to be the wisest one. Well, something had to be done for the Bluebird. He could never fly south this year, so someone would have to take him in for the winter. Woo! Woo! Yes, who would provide a home for the Bluebird? Velvet the Fawn didn't have a home, really. Banjo lived in the old stone fence, no place for a bluebird. Widow Beaver lived in the pond, so that was out. Peter Cottontail and Buttons lived in holes in the old oak tree. No room for a bluebird to exercise his wing. Perhaps Pokey, no. As for Inky, a tree limb was his home, as it was for old Doc Owl. What could they do? They needed a snug home, a home that was large enough, a home that... And then they thought of it. Grumble's Cave. Of course, let's go. So off they went. The home they had thought of belonged to Grumble's the bear. But the big cave where Grumble's lived was closed. A big snowdrift covered the entrance. Here was a job for volunteers. I'll do it, said Widow Beaver. And she began to shovel. Of course, the twins helped too. Pretty soon they could hear Grumbles. He was still asleep. Grumbles finally understood and said, Yes, he was willing to let the bluebird share his warm cave until spring. In fact, Grumble said, he could use the handkerchief he found one day while picking berries. We'll use that for a bandage, said old Doc Owl. And in a little while, the bluebird's wing was bandaged. Once or twice, he tried to sing a song of thanks. And so, very quietly, all the animals tiptoed out of Grumble's house. Then, old Doc said it seemed only fair to him that the animal should bring food that the bluebird might eat. Even Pokey agreed. Velvet uncovered some soft moss for the bluebird's bed. Peter Cottontail had some carrots he had saved. Buttons had some sweet hazelnuts. Inky brought dried sunflower seeds. And Pokey dug out some dried apples. Widow Beaver bit off a twig full of purple dogwood berries. And Banjo the raccoon brought two sweet potatoes. They were putting the food near a little tree when Peter Cottontail remembered something. Why not hang the food where the bluebird would see it? On the tree, like the one he'd seen in the cabin. In a few moments, they were making a game of it. And in no time at all, they had added red holly berries and bittersweet, the color of flame. The beaver twins had brought some icicles, and there in the moonlight, the little trees stood with their gifts. It was late. Now they were tired. Doc suggested that they turn in and come back in the morning to show their gifts to the bluebird. So, homeward they went. Velvet went along the path that led by the lone cabin. What was that? There, near the cabin. Reindeer. Reindeer, much
much like velvet. They were tied to a beautiful red sleigh filled with packages. Perhaps the reindeer told Velvet that it was Christmas Eve, that wonderful night when people exchange gifts to show their love for one another. And perhaps Velvet told them how the animals of Cozy Valley helped the bluebird. Anyway, just as they were getting better acquainted, <laughs> Velvet did not wait to see more. When he reached his sheltering trees, he heard the little bells again. And there, above him, were the reindeer and sleigh. It was early dawn when the animals gathered at Grumble's cave. The tree and the gifts looked truly beautiful in the morning light. Now it was time to call the bluebird. Inky had the loudest voice, so... There was the bluebird. And right behind him was Grumbles. He was still sleeping. Until he saw the gifts on the tree. Widow Beaver offered the bluebird her flat tail as a sled. Around the tree she pulled him. The bluebird didn't make a sound. But he was happy, as all the animals could see. In fact, the merrymakers were having so much fun, they didn't notice... Rusty the Fox! None of the animals moved, except Grumbles. Seeing that Rusty looked so thin and hungry, he decided to offer him a sweet potato. No one had ever offered Rusty anything before. He was so surprised, he... Well, he smiled. And the animals of Cozy Valley smiled back. And after he had gobbled that sweet potato, he joined the fun with all the rest. They were so busy making friends and looking at the gifts on the tree that for a moment they forgot the bluebird. And then they saw him. Very slowly, he had hopped all the way to the very top of the tree. Then his little chest swelled with joy. He had only one way to show his thankfulness. The animals were overjoyed. The bluebird is singing. The bluebird is singing. Now they knew he would get well. And the bluebird sang as no bluebird had ever sung before. It was a song filled with friendship and the love he felt for all the animals. The same love the animals felt for one another. And that was the way the animals of Cozy Valley discovered the joy of making others happy at Christmas.
Claus. Yes, that's it. Don't be afraid. 